Hello, and welcome to St. Luke's Gallery. The purpose of this site is to share my appreciation of sacred art with you and hopefully persuade you to look at art in general in a new perspective. One reason why I created this site is because we're all looking at our computers, iPads and phones, especially now with so much of the outside world locked down. Unfortunately, a lot of what's online is designed to provoke us, scandalize us, and in the case of most social media outlets, dumb us down. I don't know about you, but I'd like to see more positivity. And on that note, I hope you'll enjoy this introduction and visit St. Luke's regularly as I develop a series. Most of us of the Christian faith are aware that St. Luke is the author of the Gospel of St. Luke, as well as one of the authors of the Acts of the Apostles, both in the New Testament. But what everyone does not know is that St. Luke is believed to have been the first icon painter. Actually, icons, despite being visual, are written, but that will be the subject of a future episode. Luke is believed by many to have authored many icons of the child Jesus and his blessed mother, including Our Lady at Chestahova, also known as the Black Madonna, and Our Lady of Vladimir, both shown here. St. Luke is therefore the patron saint of artists, and so it is fitting that this site is named in his honor. St. Luke the Evangelist, or a Pronobis. Now let's look at the definition of sacred as defined by Merriam-Webster. 1. Dedicated or set apart for the service or worship of a deity, devoted exclusively to one service or use. Worthy of religious veneration, holy, entitled to reverence and respect. Of or relating to religion, not secular or profane. Okay, so if we focus only on the first definition, we could say, hey, any art is potentially sacred if it is meant to be tied in some type of worship. But, as we see in the second part, the meaning of the definition builds. We see that there's a holy aspect to it, entitled to reverence and respect. Sacred and holy are kind of synonymous when you think about it, and if it's going to be holy, it certainly can't be secular, and it definitely can't be profane. Okay, I think that's enough text, so let's take a look at some examples of sacred art. This is the interior of a Roman Catholic church, and I think everyone can agree it is attractive. At first glance, when do you think this church was built? The 1870s? The early 1900s? No later than 1910? Try 1950. Yes, 1950. I purposely took this photo over to the side of the church for a reason. Take a look at this for a couple of seconds. And where does your eye gravitate? That's right, to the main altar where our Lord reposes in the tabernacle. And that's where one's attention should be in a Catholic church. It's not about the priest. It's certainly not about us. It's about, well, it's about the guy who established the church. Okay, so why are we looking at the architecture of a church instead of some paintings? Because sacred art is a holistic experience. The tabernacle in the distance is framed by a gorgeous high altar, which is framed by a soaring mural depicting the beatific vision. The four evangelists, along with Christ the King, adorn the archway into the altar. The stations of the cross surrounding the church are realistic and they're reverent. They're not abstract. And the same for the stained glass windows. Altogether, it's a place of visual meditation on the sacred mysteries. Now let's show a good example of a Byzantine Rite Catholic Church. Visually, in terms of both art and architecture, there are some differences between the Roman and the Byzantine Rites. But here, like we saw in the previous example, the architecture and the adorning artwork work together to create an atmosphere of visual meditation on the mysteries of the faith. For those not familiar with the Byzantine Rite, the altar area is behind the iconostasis. In the photo on the left, Note how the mosaic of Mary, the mother of God, with the child Jesus leads visually into the crucifix and then into the icon of Christ the King, surrounded by other icons of the disciples and key figures from the Old Testament. Over on the right, we're looking up and seeing the interior of this domed church, adorned with Christ again, this time he's in heaven, guarding over his church and his people. Oh, and this church was built in the 1960s. I purposely share these two 20th century examples to drive home the point that sacred art and architecture do not have to be a thing of history. Sacred art never goes out of style. And then we come to this example. 
Believe it or not, this is a Catholic church. Unlike the previous church examples, this one is not a place where one can visually meditate upon the mysteries of the faith. There's no tabernacle in the center, or even to the side as far as I can see. There's no crucifix. There's no stations of the cross, no stained glass windows. It's just a cold, brutalist space. I have not been to this church, so the priests and the parishioners may be very devout for all that I know, but for a church that was obviously built not that long ago, it was really a missed opportunity to glorify God. And it gets worse, I'm afraid. This too is a Catholic church, I'm sorry to report. I want to say that it looks like Darth Vader's house, but the truth of the matter is, it looks demonic. The cold, gray, and brutally designed wall. The prison-like skylights at the top, letting in the minimalist of light. That sinister red room over to the left of the altar. If we go back to the definition of sacred by Merriam-Webster, 1. It is not worthy of religious veneration. The atmosphere is far from holy. Nothing here is reverent or respectful. 2. It may be a Catholic church, but there's very little here that conveys the Catholic faith. It is a worldly design, secular in nature, and yes, it is profane. In the early days of Christianity, most of the population was illiterate, from the Roman Empire to Byzantium and beyond. Reading and writing was a luxury for the very privileged, educated few. Not only that, but the Bible itself had not yet been composed. Most of the works of the New Testament were still being written. Going to Mass was also a challenge, since the Church faced immediate and frequent persecution. So the faithful, in many circumstances, were largely catechized by word of mouth and by visual reference. Enter the icon. The two examples here are from those early days. On the left we have Christ the Abbot Mina, a Byzantium icon that goes back to the 6th century, now in Paris's Louvre Museum. And on the right, one that is even earlier, the Good Shepherd from the Catacomb of Priscilla in Rome. This one dates very early, to the years 250 to 300 AD. As you can imagine, the writers of these two icons had limited resources and especially in the case of the Good Shepherd, they probably had to write in secrecy. We are fortunate that these two examples of early Christian sacred art even exist, considering the persecutions faced by the early church. I'm going to leave Christ and the Abbot Mina in this slide, but focused in on Christ himself and bring in a later icon. The icon on the right is Christ the Savior, or the Pantocrator, in the Egyptian Sinai St. Catherine's Monastery. Note how, despite the obvious difference of age and execution, the one on the right maintains the mood set by the one on the left. And now we see the Pantocrator again, with an even more recent depiction. The one on the right is also the Pantocrator, and this icon adorns the interior dome of the Church of the Savior on Spilled Blood in St. Petersburg, Russia, circa 1883. A much, much later execution but the icon is still true to its predecessors, written during the early years of the church. A totally illiterate person with no education about Christianity could enter this church in St. Petersburg and visually understand that this non-worldly man up above, surrounded by the heavens and the angels, is the protector over all that is below. No words are necessary. Okay, so what separates an icon from a portrait? In the book of St. Matthew, chapter 17, Jesus takes Peter, James, and John to a mountain and is transfigured before them. What they see is our Lord in a new form. Later, as I showed on an earlier slide after the resurrection, he appears in another shape to two of the disciples. He's there in front of them, but something has happened. He is not of this world. Not of this world indeed. When we look at an icon, we're not looking at a person of the world. The facial expressions, the eyes especially, the colors, the anatomy, so much more. What an icon does is take us out of this world and into the kingdom of heaven. We see our Lord, his mother, his angels, and his saints in another non-worldly way. In these next few images, I'm going to ask that you simply look at them. Don't ever think, just look.
With all due respect to Michelangelo and Da Vinci, I'm going to focus this series' paintings episodes on works by lesser-known artists. Not that there's anything wrong with Michelangelo or Da Vinci, they were brilliant artists, but the World Wide Web is filled with images, videos, and lectures on their works. Like the icons of the Eastern Rites, the paintings of the Roman Rite initially served to not only glorify God, but also to visualize the sacred scriptures to the masses of people without the gift of literacy so many of us take today for granted. A great example is this one, the Yetz altarpiece created by Jan van Yick in 1432. In the center, Christ the King features prominently with his Blessed Mother and his forerunner, St. John the Baptist, on his side. They are surrounded by angelic choirs, and on the outside looking in, we see Adam and Eve. Below, we can see the connection between Christ the King and the Agnus Dei, or the Lamb of God, if you're not familiar with Latin. Note how the Holy Ghost above the Lamb is at the very top of the lower center image, leading your eye to the window above the beatific vision. And another from the pre-Renaissance period of the 14th century is this one, the, La the Lamentation by Giotto. This is a fresco found in the Scrovegni Chapel in Veneto, Italy. It's just one of several that adorn that church, telling the various chapters in the life of Jesus. This next photo is the lower church of the Basilica of St. Francis in Assisi, Italy. This picture really doesn't do it justice considering the age of the church and how well it has been preserved all of these centuries. Going back to an earlier statement, imagine what an incredible visual catechism this was to the people of Umbria in the pre-Renaissance era. As this series develops, I'll be spending quite a bit of time on individual paintings, so I won't go into too much detail right now. After all, I do want you to visit my site often. That said, I would be giving you a disservice if I didn't give you a preview of what is to come. Every Christmas, we look for the right Christmas cards, hoping to find something like this, The Adoration of the Shepherds by Gerard van Hunthorst. Unlike the Gent's altarpiece, this one is more focused on one chapter in the life of Jesus, but wow, what a visual telling of that chapter. Typically with artwork of the 17th century, you never saw people smiling. But here, von Hunthorst broke the rules, and with that incredible source of light emanating from the Christ child, he perfectly illustrated the joy of the nativity, the third joyful mystery of the rosary. I don't know if he planned it this way in advance, but this painting, also by von Hunthorst, we see the human smile and the powerful light source, but in a much more somber setting. Like his painting of the adoration of the shepherds, here in The Mocking of Christ, the execution assists the viewer with being able to fully meditate on what's going on here. I don't think anyone looking at this could not feel our Lord's disappointment as he's mocked by the people he created and loved while they apply the crown of thorns. Many excellent paintings of the crucifixion and death of Christ can be found throughout the world's churches and museums, and a lot of them don't really capture the sheer agony and horror of what our Lord went through. One of the exceptions is the 1633 painting by Rembrandt. While not as graphic as the Mel Gibson film The Passion of the Christ, it is nevertheless a thought-provoking work, illustrating the temporary extinguishing of the light of Christ into the dark and sinful world. Here, Christ's lifeless, broken body is carefully taken down from the bloodstained cross and into the arms of what is probably St. John. The focal point of this painting, well, to me at least, is the sorrowful expression on St. John's face as he receives his Lord. It's a very appropriate image to meditate on while praying the fifth sorrowful mystery of the Rosary. Well, since I've shared a couple of paintings of Christ's nativity, passion, and death, I guess I owe you one of his resurrection, and this one by the Russian painter Alexander Ivanov is one of my personal favorites. A future episode will be devoted to Ivanov, so I'm going to hold comment until later. Until then, enjoy this preview. As I come to a close, I'd like to end with a couple paintings of two beloved saints and doctors of the church, St. Francis of Assisi and St. Teresa of Avila. On the left, we have St. Francis by Francisco de Zubaran, painted in a rather unexpected way. Note how the focus isn't so much on Francis himself, we don't even see his eyes, for example, 
but rather on a visual depiction of his humility and his intense prayerful life, captured really well by the dramatic lighting and shadows, similar to what we saw earlier from von Hontorst. At first glance, St. Teresa by the French painter Francois Girard comes across as a typical 19th century portrait, but look closely at her eyes, and you can see that, is, that this is not just another portrait like the ones that he did for worldly diplomats and people of society. Teresa is not looking at us. Her eyes are fixated on something else, something that has given her an unworldly expression, something similar to what we saw with the Byzantine icons. These two paintings are good examples of what one would expect to see at the world's great museums, but unlike a portrait of Napoleon or George Washington, the two artists knew their subject matter and took extra measures to create something that falls within the realm of the sacred. And that concludes this introductory presentation on sacred artwork. Thank you for watching, and I invite you to come back again for additional presentations. Until then, please visit stlooksgallery.com and also the channels on BitChute, Vimeo, Rumble, or YouTube. If you have a question or a comment, you can email me via mail at stlooksgallery.com. Thank you again, and may God bless you.